Core Confidence Life. 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 Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Core Confidence Life. Once again, I am your host, Dennis R. Sumlin, broadcasting to you right here in New York City. I mean, um, so city. Sorry, call up here. Hmm. Yeah. So on today's program, we have a very, very exciting interview. I'm going to be talking to a marriage and family therapist. That's right. Um, by the name of Jason Wesser. And this interview isn't going to be like you may be expecting when I say marriage and family. We're actually going to be talking about the interplay between the mind and body, how oftentimes physical illnesses are due to psychological baggage that we're holding on to. Also, how can we heal physical illnesses by the mind? That's right. And we also get into a little bit of self-pleasure. And we talk about why people are hesitant to increase their self-pleasure and the pleasure with their partner. So we're going all holistic today here on The Core Confidence Life with marriage and family therapist, Jason Wesser. And um, yeah, don't forget to visit coreconfidencelife.com to uh, catch all the podcasts that you may have missed because you know you want to hear them all and uh, look at some of our courses online. If you want to know how to be a better speaker, turn to us. And now we turn to Jason Wesser. But of course, you know, we got to play the theme first, right? You know it. I know it. We all know it. So let's do it. You are listening to the Core Confidence Life podcast, a personal development program that addresses issues around relationships, sex, society, and spirituality from a no holds bars holistic perspective. With a non-traditional approach to current events, manhood, and culture, our expert guests, deep discussion, and actionable steps will help you develop healthy relationships, inner peace, and a stronger sense of self and direction. Listener discretion is advised. All right, we are on the program, and we are live here on video, and we are talking to Jason Wasser. He is a family and marriage uh, therapist, and we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. It's actually several interesting topics. Um, one is going to be around uh, psychological trauma causing physical illnesses, and we might get into a little... Uh, self-pleasure as we go through the program. What's going on, Jason? Well, it's a pleasure to be here hanging out with you. And I think the entire conversation we're going to be having, hopefully will be pleasurable for both of us and everybody out there listening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. So, so Jason, now I introduced you as a uh, therapist and family marriage uh, psychologist, psych uh, therapist, blah, 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 blah. My words are messing up. And all yeah, that good video. stuff, all that so, good stuff. Tell us what all that is. So I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, uh, which means that I have a master's degree from a family therapy program. Um, I'm also a clinical supervisor, uh, which means that I supervise other postgraduate before they get fully licensed therapists along the way to specialize uh, in their training that they're required to by the state. And this is in most states that they become registered interns and they have to have a clinical supervisor to guide them, coach them, do case consultation. But my real bread and butter, my real passion and niche is the integrative mind-body medicine as it connects to what's going on for you physically and emotionally in your life. Mind-body connection. Very important. You know, we always, we always talk about um, what, one of the mottos that we used to use here at Core Confidence Life is master your inner game and take the field, which is really to communicate the things that go on on the outside, the things that you manifest and actually do on the outside, actually begin on the inside, in your, Absolutely. In your mind, in your conscious, and even in your subconscious. 100% agree. And in fact, one of my favorite new teachings that I've been sharing with my clients is that you'll never get anything different to show up in your world than that which you believe. So that world, right, what you're getting and what's showing up for you What's happening to you, as we would say, is just a reflection and mirror of your personal beliefs that you are now just projecting out there. Absolutely. And uh, this reminds me, um, 
just thinking about, there's a course I have online, it's uh, corecompetencelife.com, it's talk about finding your values. And one of the things I'm using there um, in the little uh, description is a lot of times that we, we have values, but then we have values that we don't know that we have. Yes. You know, there's always subconscious things going on underneath and we're valuing things that we don't necessarily know we're valuing. We can find out by our actions. Because often we say, I value this, my principles are these, but our actions are very different because subconsciously we actually have different values. Right. And sometimes the experiences and results that we have actually don't match up with our values that we intellectually or rationally say we have. So as I like to joke around with my clients, you know, that great uh, psychologist, Dr. Cube once said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Right. So, <laughs> I remember that song. Yeah, do you? I so. do. I do. I'm no young spring chicken. I'm an old fart. So <laughs> I remember that, Mr. Jason, sir. Um, yeah. So, Mr. Jason, sir, um, tell us about the interplay between mind and body, just as a foundation. How are they connected? Absolutely. So if we just wanted to go back just to make it a nice, even platform from what you were just talking about in core values, I'm a huge fan of values-based decision-making. And the first thing that I would start off with, with any of my clients is I can't help you solve a problem unless I know what you believe. And I also know what your core values are because a lot of the times the decisions that someone's making, right? That cognitive dissonance is that they're enacting a life that isn't truly in alignment with their core values. And once I get them down to the nitty gritty of what that is using a certain uh, worksheet and, and, and walking them through it and, and helping them whittle it down, then I can say, if you are truly living in these, uh, in alignment with those you know, core values and the beliefs around that, what do you think would be happening for you differently? And a lot of times they say this is you know, 90, 90 to 100% of my problems would probably go away. So I like the simplicity aspect of it. And again, as we say, on a neurological level, whatever is subconscious or unconscious will become your experience and your awareness around you. And you will never get a reality different than that which you believe, even if you aren't aware on that conscious level, on that neocortex rational brain level, that this is kind of what you've uh, been programmed with. And the work that I do, specifically using neuroemotional technique, which we're going to get into in a little bit, helps realign the three parts of your brain, your neocortex, your mammalian and reptilian brain, and get rid of those fight or flight, self-sabotaging, self-limiting experiences, and allows you to be fully proactive and move to a place where you can actually get more of what you want and what you desire out of life. Hmm, absolutely. Now, here's a question. I just was talking about the uh, Finding Your Values uh, mini course, and that brings me to this question. If you have values that you don't know you have or principles or things that you really don't know you have that's screwing up your physical health, as we'll get into in a minute, how do you discover these unknown values? Do you have any uh, methods or tips that you, you have that you use? Yeah, so I think starting from the end in mind, that reverse engineering philosophy is really important. Um, people, including I actually just had this conversation with a couple uh, that I'm seeing, and um, as we talk about their long-term plans, they're like, oh, well, yeah, in the next two years. I'm like, well, what about the next 10 years? What about the next 20 years? They recently got married. They've been together for a few years, but they're so short-sighted with, because there's a lot of chaos going on in their life of uh, figuring out where they want to move and figuring out what their new careers will be if they move. Are they going to commute to work uh, you know, overseas? So I like reverse engineering, a longer game plan, the marathon, not the 5K sprint. And from there, you can actually make a lot more efficient and simple decision making that will help you figure out really what's important to you. Because you're saying that, well, I know I want to make X amount of dollars in the next year. Okay, that's great. But we're going to look at it from like, you know, that 3%, 5% growth. But whens if that's actually you need to have more money or you want to live in a different place or uh, you whatever is important to you is because you're too short sighted versus a long term goal, you can actually open up more possibilities for you that way, and the priorities will change, and my guess is possibly your core values will support you getting there much easier hmm. absolutely so yeah let's dive right into that now so we're talking about 
values and subconscious values and how that affects everything that goes on around you. Also, the things that you have in your mind and the worries and concerns and baggage you're carrying with you also affects your physical health. It actually causes or sustains or makes worse any physical ailments you might be having. So talk a little bit about uh, this mind-body connection as it, as it uh, pertains to uh, illnesses. What's, what's causing my cold? What, I have a sore foot. Oh my God. Oh, my penis hurts. Help, Jason. What's going on? So from the first uh, aspect that I'll look at is, is just the word disease, right? That is the word that we kind of are, everybody has some type of thing going on. You go to the doctor, you get diagnosed with a disease. But if you break that word into, into two, it's dis-ease, that you're not at ease with what's going on inside and outside of you. And I think that the work that I do as a therapist using NET, using other modalities, is to find and help a person become at ease with what's going on. In other words, we're removing the fight or flight. We're removing the resistance and we're getting rid of the trauma and the triggers that are around it. So yes, when let's say you go to a doctor, you're stressed out, you have these pains, these aches, all these different things that are going on for you and they, they can find anything and they're gonna be like, oh, well, you know, you need a therapist. It's just psychosomatic. And they're kind of in a way, a lot of times doctors uh, in that world will kind of be like, oh, it's all in your head. You're making it up. But research shows, and especially with all the research that NET and the One Research Foundation are doing in collaboration with using this modality, is that somatic experiences do get stuck in your body and can cause a host and variety of symptoms that will turn into anxiety, stress, depression, chronic pain, uh, physical issues, immune issues, digestive issues, shoulder issues, right? Chronic subluxation from a chiropractic perspective. Um, so all of these things are very much well-documented and well-connected. And NET is the modality that I use specifically to help find those psychosomatic stressors and remove that fight or flight uh, trigger that's going on with them. What are some of the more common physical symptoms that seem to derive from emotional uh, baggage and things? Everything. It's really interesting that if you look at um, some of the psycho-spiritual work that's been out there, let's talk about like the Louisa Hay work, uh, all incredible stuff. And, and that's, um, I can't remember the name of her, Hay House Publishing, right? There's so many wonderful and amazing authors and books that have come out from it, but it's still to me in the training that I have, it's still pretty linear. And they're like, well, if you have a pain in your shoulder, it must be because of this issue. And if you have a pain in your lower left leg, it must be because of this issue. For the training that I have, that's a good start and a good insight. And you can start asking questions to a client about, well, what's going on about that specific theme for you? But using NET, the tool I have is actually a neurological muscle test. And we can actually determine the fight or flight. Then I keep using that word and I'll go into it a little bit more. Are you neutral about what's going on internally and externally? Or is there some physiologic, physiological response that's turning on your nervous system to either be safe or run away from an experience? So by using the neurological muscle test, we can kind of flow chart what's happening internally and actually find the true non-conscious story or subcon and subconscious story that's actually going on when that trauma got instilled in the person's body and help them reset their nervous system so it no longer triggers them. So from my perspective, I think, again, that, that more linear approach is an incredible way to start to start asking questions to help a person become more self-aware. But if you want to go deeper, you actually want to remove not just the rational understanding of it because you can't talk your way out of a paper bag. You can understand something, but it doesn't mean it changes your nervous system response. Then I think, you know, from my experience and my expertise as an NET certified practitioner is that you need something like this modality to actually remove the nervous system physiology from happening. Mm, you know, you reminded me of, of something that happened a couple of years ago. I was laid out on a massage table, getting a massage, right? And then when he got to uh, my, my knee area on one of my legs, I started to tense up for no reason. I was fine the whole time and I started to tense up around this particular area, around, right. uh, around the knee area. And lo and behold, when I thought like, why is that happening? Um, because I know that when someone contacts certain areas of your body, it will trigger old wounds and things that's happened in that area. 
Yes. Um, so I was wondering why is this going on here? And I remember that a, you know, a while ago when I, was a, when I was a teen, I had knocked that particular knee and that particular leg out of joint. And I was in the hospital and I was on, and I had came home with crutches. And I guess that trauma was still stored in that knee. And so when he came across it, it triggered all of that. Absolutely. There's a great book called Feelings Buried Alive, Never Die. And it definitely does go into a lot of cool stuff about that. And yes, our body does story and carry trauma. So you had a very conscious linear understanding of I actually injured that part. So when someone actually gave me some level of healing and tenderness and compassion in that space, you are allowed and capable of having a emotional release. For a lot of people, uh, you know, trauma doesn't have to be you're a military vet or uh, you got into a massive car accident or some, or you're, you know, you were grew up in a home of domestic violence. I view trauma as anything that your mind and body doesn't allow itself to reset back into normal homeostasis, that normal balance of what you're doing. And for many people, they can't figure out why specifically this is happening to me, or they'll think it's just a physical symptom and not think about the um, the mind body connection to it. So for example, I have a client who I've been seeing who came in for a, uh, a trauma in their family. And as they move from the stages of grief to a more healthier place, I asked them knowing what I do now, is there anything else that you would want to solve that you wouldn't have thought you'd wanted to solve because you came in for the grief and trauma, but now that's on the side, what else would you have come to me for? And this person said, well, I have this shoulder issue and I've been in a sling for the last two years and I had surgery on it. I did PT, I did occupational therapy, I did orthopedic rehab and it, my range of motion is only a little bit above my shoulder and no one knows why it's not getting better. So my response was, let me throw some NET at it. I can't guarantee it'll do anything different, but maybe something will show up that we can trace back to why this is going on for you. And maybe you'll have a little bit more range of motion. So I walked them through their protocol and we find that there was an original event from this person's childhood that was being re-triggered by a present day experience that had nothing to do with the grief that they were going through that they came to me for, but a totally separate issue. And as we did the nervous system correction, which is one of the last parts of this protocol, and we went back into the original present day scenario. The, ner the fight or flight muscle test no longer showed up. And then I had them move their arm around and they had full 100% range of motion for the first time in over two years. Mm. Right. Let's play ball. Let's play ball. Right. So what, what is the most dramatic story you've got that you're allowed to say? Um, mm -hmm. Where people just had all these catastrophic physical ailments and it all came down to what's going on um in their mind and in, in past trauma because you know I, I mentioned the story you mentioned the story but what is the most catastrophic one that you can tell well i think the first most catastrophic story was how i actually got into net for myself as a as a patient slash client before i was actually a practitioner um and literally about nine and a half ten years ago uh 2010 um, I was having major panic attacks and major anxiety attacks, even uh, right, just relaxing at home or when I was actually at a, a workshop and doing a training. Um, and there was some major stuff going on. I was going through a separation and then a divorce at that point. And I, on my conscious aware side, I knew I was okay. I had work, I had friends, I had a support system, but these panic attacks that I never had before were, were just getting worse and worse and more frequent. And I did everything. I went to acupuncture. I did yoga, I went for massage, I went to a you know, traditional psychotherapist, talk therapy. I was really doing everything and changed my nutrition and nothing was working. Even went to a psychiatrist. Um, and, you know, at that point, my, my anxiety of, of these constant repetitive thoughts of, of self-sabotage, uh, you know, why did I go through this? What happened? Why did I screw this up? You know, the, the, the blame that I was giving myself was so heavy that my mind was always racing. I then was referred to a colleague of mine um, who I, I knew, actually I grew up with two of her, her kids, 
Um, and my friend's like, why don't you go see this person for NET? And I knew about NET from a workshop, but um, they only gave a little bit of an explanation of it and a demo of it, but we didn't go deeper into it. It wasn't an NET uh, certified training. It was a training through University of Miami's medical school uh, in their integrative medicine department. And I went to uh, this colleague of mine, Leia, for two sessions. And within between the second and third session, all my panic attacks went away. And I remember thinking of old memory and old thought that would trigger me into feeling really crappy. And it just literally slid off my brain, like there was Vaseline on my brain. And I think that was the beginning. A month later, I took my first NET workshop. And now a bunch of years later, I'm, I hold their highest level three certification and am one of a handful of mental health practitioners in the world that have their highest certification. But I think that drastic experience that I went through not only changed my life and how I see a lot of things when it comes to mind body, but also the ability to now work with over a thousand client sessions a year. Um, and men, most of them I'm using NET with. So that's on my side. Yeah, absolutely. Now here's a question I thought of, how about the reverse? So let's say if somebody is ill and it could be a legitimate physical ailment, not necessarily connected to trauma, is it possible for someone to heal that with the mind, with specific thoughts or specific whatever you would you know, know? So is that possible or, or have you seen that happen? Absolutely. So we're really going to probably start getting into the world of epigenetics and neuroplasticity and all that. Hey, fun stuff. Get, get, hey well, that's what we're here for. Fantastic. So, yeah, so I'm a huge fan of like Dr. Joe Dispenza. I know people are now jumping on the Dr. Joe Dispenza bandwagon. And um, I've been a big fan of his actually one of my first NET seminars. I think it was my second NET seminar. Um, someone introduced me to his TED talk. And if people out there, your listeners haven't seen it, that would be the first place I would suggest to start. It's Dr. Joe Dispenza's TEDx talk. And it'll say TED Tacoma. So, again, you know, from the from Washington. And that really does explain an incredible understanding of mind body science and your thoughts and, and how your thoughts control your reality and how it actually changes all your biochemistry and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also Dr. Bruce Lipton. Um, I give him the book, uh, the title of the book is Slipping Biology of Belief is his book. Um, and he's got an amazing, wonderful YouTube videos as well. So for people who prefer the video over the, you know, versus the reading, um, those are my first two introductions into like really seeing that you could, by changing your beliefs, by changing what you focus on, put your attention on, you could have downstream and potentially will have successful outcomes in changing what you want. And then of course I got introduced to the whole law of attraction world and Napoleon Hill and Esther Hicks. Um, you know, and, and, and the teachings of Abraham and all that stuff like that. So I have seen radical changes in people who apply not just the mind body uh, physical work, like going to a massage therapist or Reiki or acupuncture or me, um, but also then incorporating a radical philosophy change. Um, and when you put those together, you have a powerful piece of the puzzle. Radical philosophy change. Now that that's very interesting. So if someone is looking for a radical philosophy change, because you know, it's, it's, I always say that most people can change, but a lot of people really don't change that much. Um, yeah. So if someone's looking to really strip down and change what they've been thinking, change, you know, the messages they've been feeding themselves and kind of move into something new, um, how would you go about telling them to start something like that? I know it's a long process. I know mm -hmm. it kind of never ends in a way, but, how do you start? Well, the first thing is to have the understanding that you can't have a Mack truck going 80 miles an hour on a highway, pivot on a dime and start going the other direction. So I very much agree with you that it is a process. There will be lots of resistance at the beginning because I look at it as emotional muscle memory. It's kind of like, you know, that Velcro uh, target that a lot of kids grew up with, with the ping pong balls, with the Velcro on it that we like throw or, da or darts, you know, on the wall. And um, you know that rationally, if you throw that ping pong ball with the Velcro or the dart at the wall, it's going to stick if you hit the target. And what we're, you know, the, 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 the change of philosophy, the, 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 the removing of resistance, the, the changing of a neuro emotional complex, uh, getting rid of that original event and changing the nervous system response through NET will actually start changing the muscle memory and your neural pathways will start to change. Your fight or flight responses will start to change, but it does take 
time and it does take commitment. And, and you know, we're, we're an instant gratification society in 2020. And we're used to things happening. If, there's, if Instagram's down, the world freaks out. If our, if our internet takes a few seconds longer to connect to a web page, <laughs> we freak out. So the idea of patience, and like we started off our conversation with, what's the 10-year plan? What's your 20-year plan? And, and, and go from that perspective, because if you've been doing something for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you could make radical, incredible changes in a very short period of time, but also know you have to change that emotional muscle memory as well. Emotional muscle memory. Very important to tell maybe one of our words of the day, our phrases of the day, emotional muscle memory. Nice. All right. So what if somebody wanted to, let's say they're, 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 they're watching this and they're going, oh, you know, this sounds great. Um, I can't necessarily hire someone as fabulous as Jason at the very moment, um, but I really like to kind of start this process. So what could someone do right now, this very moment, or at least after watching this, um, to move towards, you know, kind of digging up some of the trauma or kind of starting to change their philosophy about things? What's one of those little crash course tips you can give? Absolutely. So NET actually has something called the first aid stress tool. And uh, if you go to the website, firstaidstresstool.com, it'll take you right to it. But what it does is that it shows you that when you have a distressing thought, a dis- you know, an uncomfortable uh, feeling, you don't necessarily need to know what's going on, but it walks you through a sequence of self acupressure points that you can do uh, on both wrists Um, And I'm going to demonstrate on the video. So if anybody's going to watch the video, so what you would do is you doesn't matter which arm you start off with, but you would hook under, uh, under one arm. So under, so if I'm going my left hand under my right hand, so I'm basically on the thumb side, I'm coming around on the thumb side uh, of my wrist and between the bone and that vein, there's that little soft fleshy spot. And you're going to put with light, very light pressure, just put your fingers there. And I'm going to turn my hand around so people can see those three fingers, the first three fingers from the flex of the wrist. And as you do that, you connect it with your forehead, kind of like you're going, oh my goodness, right? The emotion point, the hypothalamus points on your forehead. So you're basically holding your forehead, cupping your forehead, holding those three points and breathing five, 10, 15 breaths in and out while thinking about that distressing point and feeling, and then flipping it and doing it on the other hand, those first three points, cupping your forehead and going through that 15, 20 breath while just don't try to change anything, just breathe in and out on that distressing or uncomfortable thought or feeling. You do that multiple times a day, that will help eliminate some of the discomfort because you're hitting all the different Chinese medicine meridians. You're going and you're hitting a whole bunch of stuff connected to a bunch of different emotions. What that's gonna allow you to do, it's not gonna hit everything. It may help for a lot of people with a, with a lot of it, but at least it's gonna keep you at a minimal level of distress and help your body and your nervous system know that there's some type of reset trying to happen. What we, I do that with my clients if they're coming in for an NET session and they're like, well, I still feel something. I'm still concerned that something might show up until I see you again. This is what I teach all of them. And people can go to uh, firstaidstresstool.com. Um, they can also go to the NET website if they can't find it, which is netmindbody.com. But they can also find a practitioner. There's, a, uh, there's certified practitioners all over the world, actually. So they can find a practitioner near them if they're not here in South Florida. Um, or they, and I don't do NET digitally or remotely. NET is not done remotely, but the therapeutic coaching that I can do, I can at least help guide them and then plug them in with a practitioner that might be local to have them actually do the dirty work that way. Oh, all right. That's wonderful. All right. That's a first aid for your mind and body. Absolutely. So you are into alternative medicine in your practice. So talk to us a little bit about alternative medicine and um, how someone might seek uh, more knowledge on alternative medicine as opposed to traditional. Sure. So my, 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 my going down the rabbit hole of alternative medicine started with my own uh, trying to figure out what's been going on with myself for many, many years. And you know, I grew up the meat and potatoes and the, the orange juice and the ice cream and the sugar and, the, and didn't have any conscious awareness of food um, and supplementation and herbs actually um, helping figure, you know, to, to help guide you and to help you have a healthier life. And I grew up with stomach issues and digestive issues and 
anxiety, as I shared before. And at a certain point, the regular system wasn't working with me. So it's funny that we call it alternative medicine because it's really the alternative to, you know, this, this medicine that's only been existing in the last 200 years, but alternative medicine has been around forever. You know, we can call it tribal healing. We can call it, you know, plant medicine. We can call it indigenous medicine. But since, you know, there's legislation and uh, lawyers and advocacy groups for big pharma and medical doctors advocating for them and for, you know, the money that they're making, uh, these other things have not been, you know, they've been pushed down and pushed aside uh, because of that. And at the end of the day, everything is really about money. So, um, so just the idea of it being called, calling alternative medicine is, is the first challenge, right? Yeah, it, it, that's a farce. You're right, because it, this has been around for millions of years. You know, it's from plants, it's from nature, but yet this pharmaceutical industry gets to hold the title of traditional medicine when that actually is alternative. And what we're talking about, you know, is natural, is the way that it was. Right. So, it's human yeah. made. Right. And I actually had a conversation with someone about this last night, if we're going to want to get into very quick 30 second politics of medicine. Actually, a great book that I would recommend for people out there is called Food Politics by Marian Nestle. I believe she's a professor at NYU, but she really does under, uncover a lot of the things like if you remember the Got Milk commercials from like the 90s and early 2000s. Oh God. Milk uh, does a body good. Uh, got good. milk paid and all this for, nonsense. Yeah. Right. Paid for by the Dairy Farmers Association in collaboration or the U.S. The US Dairy Association in collaboration with the government because people were, you know, the, the, the amount of milk that was being uh, consumed was getting less and therefore it was costing the farmers more money to raise because they weren't getting money from that in return. So they had a big subsidy and that's where that, that art marketing advertisement came from. And in fact, the most interesting thing was a lot of the people there were athletes or, um, or famous people, but one of the people that were on the Got Milk was uh, Health and Human Services uh, Secretary Donna Shalala at the time. She was one of those people who for, then became the University of Miami uh, Dean or President. But to have a politician pushing it shows that there is so much that we don't know and we don't look at. So the conversation I had with a friend last night was we're familiar with bare medicine, right? They Tylenol and all these other drugs um, that they've produced since, you know, 1930s, 1940s. Um, and my, my understanding is that they have multiple cancer treatment patents that this company owns, Bayer. And People are also familiar with the company Monsanto, which is with all the lawsuits and uh, Roundup and the pesticides and the glyphosate, uh, which causes a lot of uh, stomach issues and why people, I think, uh, are having so many uh, gluten issues these days is not just because the, um, the quality of our wheat is bad, but because it's loaded with pesticides and, pres and all these other things that our body's attacking um, as an immune disorder to get rid of uh, the chemicals that our bodies are consuming. But recently, and this is not, you know, you people can Google this, Monsanto recently bought Bayer. Mm -hmm. So you have the company that owns cancer patents being now owned by a company that's being constantly sued for giving people cancer. Yeah. So, you know, no conspiracy theory. People can Google this. <laughs> well, all this is sick care. You know, I know a yes. few people think this is, you know, what we have now in this country is not health care, it's sick care. You know, we, you go to the doctor after you're puking your guts out, you know, um, and food is allowed to have all these addictive chemicals in it. Um, and this, the whole thing is a big old clusterfuck of silliness and profit. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the big thing. And I have, it's funny on my, um, on my mom's side, my uncle, her brother is a medical doctor. My grandmother's two brothers are uh, old school psychiatrists, MD psychiatrists that have been practicing and um, they're in their 80s. One passed away about a year and change ago, but uh, the other one's in his mid 80s and still practicing as a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst and a ton of other medical professionals. And, and for me, right, I'm the opposite, like I'm the kook, right, who, who went into natural integrative health and um, instead of having a client for 20, 30 years, I'm like, wow, I can help you fix this in like six to 12 weeks. And they don't understand that. And I think that this is an important thing that if you're into natural or integrative or complementary 
and alternative medicine, this stuff is research. This stuff has stuff that's going on, whether you're going from uh, Andrew Weil out in Arizona, or you're talking about um, the doctors in New York, like you know, Mark Furman and anybody who's talking about nutrition and diet and functional medicine, which is here and growing and will, will be the future of integrative and collaborative healthcare. These are all things that I had to make a conscious decision to not only be interested in for myself, but how can I not include this to what I'm giving my clients? Because I believe it's completed the, the, the puzzle of full body health. That if you're stressed out, your vitamin B, <clears throat> excuse me, your vitamin B, you're gonna have a deficiency in vitamin B. Those are stress handling vitamins. So I wanna know what's going on. Are you, if for my clients who are alcoholics and I'm working with them on their recovery, then you know we need to know. Do you need vitamin B supplementation? Are you being are you craving more uh, alcohol because of old traumas that you haven't resolved? And I'll throw any tea at that. Do I need to look at supplementation or homeopathy? So I have a nutritionist in my practice, and I have a chiropractor in my practice. So it's a whole mind body round about approach to fixing and solving all these things. Mm, excellent. So we've we've talked a lot um, about. Uh, illness and medicine and the FDA clusterfuck and Donna Shalala. So I'd like to turn the uh, conversation towards some pleasure, but I'm going to ask, what questions do you wish I had asked you when, we, when we've been talking about all this with medicine and mind body healing? So, so far, everything's been pretty spot on. I think the question that I get asked the most is I've never heard about this stuff, whether they're a client or even more so if they're a practitioner of a healing art, that they're a licensed, whether they're a therapist or even an acupuncture or chiropractor or nutritionist, that the programs out there are very much in alignment with government uh, regulations, right? The ADA, the American Dietary Association, or... um, all of these mind body things aren't making it into the normative mainstream academic um, programs. So, you know, if you want to learn more about this, you're going to go to something that may or may not be accredited. It may not have the prestige as even a local university might have, and people might look down on it. But I think in the last five years, this is changing radically. Um, I didn't know about this stuff as a in fact, I didn't even think I could practice this stuff as a practitioner. I thought I would have to go, go to a chiropractor and an acupuncturist and this whole idea of neurological muscle testing, which is journal uh, published. Um, Dr. Dan Monty uh, out of Jefferson Medical School, who's the chair of the integrative medicine department there, also um, very involved in the One Research Foundation and leading the research that's happening with NET, um, has a, a journal article about muscle testing um, as a clinically valid approach to nervous system fight or flight. So. Until I was a patient of this until I realized I could actually become a practitioner. So for anybody out there that is a licensed medical practitioner, that you have a, a, a license to assess, diagnose, and treat, you could potentially become a nerd, uh, NET practitioner. There's other wonderful modalities out there, body talk and EFT and TFT and all these other uh, energy medicine modalities. And there's a, I believe, a uh, energy medicine consortium. Um, so for people out there who are interested in that, that are practitioners, you can go find what might be appropriate for your licensure or your certifications and your training as patients search, Google research, trust people out there that are, that are doing these type of healing modalities. Um, there's a great documentary called stressed, which it was all about the research, uh, the cancer research and the post-traumatic stress disorder treatment that we've been doing with NET out of Jefferson Medical School. So you can take a look at that. But there's incredible, incredible stuff out there, but people don't know even to ask if this stuff exists. And I think that's the question that I uh, want to sh- answer that you know could be asked and should be asked. I, I think it's so important. And, I'm, and one of these good things about you know uh, modern technology is that we have so much information we can get at our fingertips. You know. You know, when, um, when I was growing up, none of this stuff was available. It existed, but it wasn't available. And then when you, heard about, when you heard about alternative this and mind body this and your mind can heal this and spirituality outside of religion and all of this stuff was laughed at. Mm-hmm. Are you kidding me? You know, um, but that's what uh, we're here to break here on this program is the traditional stigma and traditional thinking. Um, and the, definitely the internet has helped with all that. And so now... Um, you can go into this as a practice and really help people with some natural solutions, kind of leaning away from the chemicals and the clusterfuck profits. 
Absolutely. And listen, I'm not against, I want to be very clear as a, as a licensed practitioner, I'm not against people going and needing pharmaceutical medication, well, right? Right. And, 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 I, and I do have this conversation all the time. My, I have a psychiatrist, the wall literally right behind me as the viewers are watching behind the, uh, behind the picture behind my head is a psychiatrist. And, you know, my, my, my playful joke is, is I'm here to steal all of her clients and get them healthy. So, um, but when my, when, when, and just a story about this, about an experience that really ties this whole, uh, notion together is that, uh, she's an incredibly lovely person and, and, and we're friendly and, um, she caringly came by my office a couple months ago and, um, offered me uh, a six or 12 pack of soda that she mistakenly bought the wrong flavor for her office. And she's like, well, would you want these? And I said, uh, with a big grin on my face, fuck no, those don't, those aren't coming in my door. And she's like, what, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, let's talk about high fructose corn syrup. Let's talk about aspartame. Let's talk about all of the things that happen to your body when you drink a soda. Forget all the chemicals, but just what happens to your body within the first five minutes with all the acidity that you're putting into it. So thank you very much, but there's no fucking way that these things are ending up in my practice. And she's like, I, I don't know what you mean. And I'm like, well, Aspartame is an insidious chemical and it causes a host of issues, including neurological things. And, and the person's response was like, I don't know if that's true. I've never seen that. And I'm like, well, this is what the research says. And, you know, people only know, and I don't blame this practitioner. They only know what they know because this is what they focus on and this is what their world is. Yeah. And a lot of times, like we were talking about, how do people change? Sometimes it does take a really personal experience for your own health to be challenged, for your own safety to be challenged, for you to start thinking differently about what it is. And I don't wish this upon anybody and people are going to do what they're going to do. I'm not here to change everybody in the world's uh, mind. Like you and I had the conversation before about certain titles and certain trainings you might want to take. That's going to rule out 50% of the population that you don't have to put any marketing time, effort, or energy into wasting. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, I think that's a big, big thing of like, you know, people are going to know what their soul is going to draw them there. Their gut's going to draw them there. Their intuition is going to draw them there. If you're willing to look outside of your own comfort zone. That's right. Or as somebody put it, expanding your comfort zone. Yes. Um, rethinking the idea of comfort zones. Um, you know, comfort zones are not bad things, but you need to expand the comfort zones, not necessarily step out of it. But that's just an alternative way of thinking about it. But, well, I think it's a very um, beautiful way of thinking about it because change happens outside of your comfort zone. Growth happens outside of your comfort zone. If you think like when people start working out, at a certain point within their workout prog pro program, they plateau. And the personal trainer or whoever they're working with has to change up the actual program and system for them because it gets comfortable, even though they might be sweating and they might have, um, you know, some muscle pain, but they actually do plateau or, you know, in anything and that we do, we're going to hit a plateau. And then you have to push yourself a little bit more. The question is, is how uncomfortable are you willing to get? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So now we've turned from pain to pleasure because I yeah. think that the human body is built to experience a range of sensations. Um, and we are people who are not only built to feel pain and our body sometimes doesn't act the way we'd like, but a lot of times our body does act the way we want because we're built to receive pleasure. Um, and I know you work with this topic as well. When it comes to mind and body, receiving pleasure, both self-pleasure and a AKA masturbation and healthy sex with a partner or more. Uh, so, the, we were talking earlier before I hit the record button about pleasure not only being physical, pleasure is also psychological. In fact, that's kind of where it derives from, is psychological. Right. Psychological arousal, right. Absolutely. So um, talk to us a little bit about the mind and body interplay when it comes to pleasure. Um, and, you know, what brings us pleasure? What, what, how do we how do we uh, psychologically determine uh, what we like and what gives us pleasure? Sure. So if we go to a very, very macro, in fact, as macro as we can possibly get. Did you say macaroni? 
mac I, well gluten free macaroni my friend gluten free but. macaroni all right well luckily i didn't buy a whole foods uh, <laughs> exactly exactly right. so so from this very wide angle macro perspective of everything is that i i personally think that pleasure uh we're, we're, we're predisposed to liking what we like and not liking what we don't like and um, and then this goes back to trying new things like, you know, all these, the, the first part of our conversation is, is completely correlated to the second part of our conversation. And we have, we do have our programming. We have our programming from our family of origin. We have programming from our culture. We have programming from religion. We have programming from our communities. You know, what people say is okay or not okay. And that comes whether it's what we're eating or what we're experiencing or where we're traveling to. And I think at a certain point, things do go back to the first thing that we discussed, which is core values. And I have a buddy of mine who says, I will never ask you to do something that's unethical, immoral, or fattening. So I think <laughs> the third part is very important. So, but then again, if you want that Ben and Jerry, sometimes you just got to suck it up, right? Okay, so, okay. but if I'm not an ice cream guy, so I wouldn't know. I'm just not into ice cream. But yeah, for those who are, yeah. So what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your go-to? Uh... Oh God, my weakness is definitely cake. Uh, cookies is second. Uh, but yeah, no, I haven't had ice cream in a while actually. Ah, oh, well, there's some good non-dairy Ben and Jerry's now if that's. Uh... Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't drink any, any more soda. I used to be a soda jerk. Oh I don't yeah. Mean the, I don't mean the job either. I'm talking about just <laughs> gallons and liters and, and, you know, pachyderm sizes of soda. Um, now I'm soda free. So there you go. Right. Right. But, uh, but the macaroni's still on the table. Uh, the, the macaroni, uh, the, the spaghetti, lasagna, and lots of lasagna for the holiday season. Mm. But yeah. And talk about pleasure. That's pleasurable. Right. Well, well, you're in New York, so you get the good stuff up there. So, right? <laughs> and we have good cooks here too. Definitely. Definitely. So, so putting it all together, going back to this whole idea of pleasure, I think that we are predisposed to liking what we like and not liking what we like. But if we are willing and open to change and experiencing new thing, I have this, this, as you're asking about this, a memory comes back to me that for years, I don't know what it is growing up in South Florida. I didn't grow up in California. So, you know, avocados and guacamole wasn't necessarily a thing here. And I remember I lived in Israel for two years after high school and, um, one of the families that I became very close with, he was um, actually a rabbi in the school. Uh, they, were, they were both from LA and moved to Israel. Um, and I remember that they would have guacamole all the time with their meals. And whenever they offered it to me, I'm like, nah, I don't know. That doesn't look so good. Like that looks gross. And for two years, every time I ate there, I passed up the guac. And I know people in like 2019, 2020 are like, what the heck? You passed up the guac. What's mentally wrong with you? But I didn't have, I had this predisposed unconscious thing of like, it looks weird. The texture is probably going to be weird. I don't really, I can't remember ever having avocado. So I had this experience of like, it's weird. I'm not going to like it. Right. And I remember one of the last weeks before I left coming back to America, I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to try it. And it was the most freaking ridiculous, delicious thing I've ever had. And I realized that like all these years, every meal I, I missed out on the guac. So I wonder how many people are missing out on their guac in their life the same way that I did and whatever that guac is to them because there's predisposed, preconceived notions about what is about that, what it would be like for them and even more so how they would be judged if they experienced it or even chose to enjoy it. Because it's such a stigma against people's guacs and yes. uh, we've grown up around all kinds of disempowering messages about anything outside of what's considered traditional pleasure you know heteronormative heterosexual yep. missionary sex with men and women yep. um and if you're outside of that narrow line of of thing then you're getting guac shame <laughs> so <laughs> you know and and we're trying to break the guac shame and it's funny that um I was talking to somebody who's, who's younger, who's going to appear on this program at another time. He's from a younger generation, and he was talking about the opposite, how um, sex is overhyped and pushed in your face. And you know, yes. I come from where everything was hidden and you were guac shamed. So it's interesting the radical changes that, uh, that uh, the generations go through. 
Um, well, but- and I agree with you. And I think that with social media, right, a lot of people, and, I, and, I've, and I've struggled with this over the years, coming from, like I said, I lived in Israel for two years after high school. I was in a very uh, insular, ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, very loving, very wonderful people, but very insular at the same time because they were protecting themselves from outside influence to uh, continue living the beliefs and the lifestyles that they chose to buy into, Right. So one of the things that they didn't have was, you know, internet access was frowned upon and, and really like, you know, if you're fit, you don't really have it, or if you did have it, it had massive filters um, that they had to, in order to only have access to certain things. And I think that there's a double-sided coin and really it has to depend on a person's predisposition. And again, their ethics and their morals and their religious beliefs to, you know, make healthy decisions, not peer pressure decisions, but healthy decisions for themselves of whatever it comes to. So yeah, I agree with you that on one side of the coin, there's a lot of shame and guilt and a lot of heteronormative um, paradigms that have been pushed. But I'm also very thankful that in 2019, as it literally is two days into 2020, as we're having this conversation, that there's so much that's different now. That's so much that can be talked about. And they're no longer button pushing conversations. They're becoming more normative and change takes time and we have to be patient. And my guess is, you know, as much as America is this incredibly open when it comes to knowledge and learning and anybody, anybody can get into a community college. So anybody can have access to information and there's libraries and the internet, but we're 200 and something years old. We're a very young prepubescent community. And I wonder in the next 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 years, we're, we're, again, we're being very short-sighted and we're suffering. The people that are suffering are suffering because they're not three, 400 years from now living in that experience. But whatever change that they're putting in, whatever fight they're fighting for, whatever openness and acceptance, you know, again, ethics, morals, safety, not harming somebody else. We have to have that conversation of, okay, what will we hope that this will look like 500 years from now? Yeah, right. We're still, especially among all the major countries in the world, we still haven't hit, we're still wet behind the ears. Our balls haven't descended yet. Exactly. And, um, and you can see we're going through, like we're right now, politically, we're going through our terrible twos. We're going through a lot of temper tantrums. Yeah. So I think that equates with a lot of um, people. Are, there, there, there is more. I think there's more self for People are talking about how this is the worst time it's ever been, right? Right now in, in, in my community, I this is the, the most amount of anti-Semitism that is happening. As you know, you live in New York. Every day of Hanukkah, the last, right, which ended a few days ago, every single day, and including till last night, there has been an attack upon a Jew in New York City that is specifically perpetrated because of anti-Semitism bigotry and other reasons, right? And this is happening in communities all over the world, not just to Jews, but to minorities and people of color and, uh, you know, for for people, transgender, whatever, maybe of sexuality. So, but right now it's being spotlighted and focused. And, And there was a great article that someone posted that if this is happening, to the Jewish community, this is a, uh, a barometer for what's going on in the world. And if we don't stop this, look what happened with Nazi Germany. Yeah, you see the seeds and um, we need to really clamp down on those seeds before they start sprouting. Right. Um, and, but they're out uh, in the open. But they're out in the open, which is good. Yeah, that, well, I always say that, like, you know, it's a contradiction. Like, I can't believe certain people, especially with cameras everywhere now, um, I can't believe certain people would do certain things, but in a way, if they're going to do them, it's good that they're open so we can get them and, right. and, and crush it. And if we right. didn't have the idiot, stupid buffoon mayor we have over here, we might actually be doing, uh, making some progress. But I'm, we won't do any of that today <laughs> on the program. Right. I right. will be political I will just well you can be you can be passionate. I can be- right? and, and, and I and I love having conversations with people who are opposite side political beliefs when we talk policy and not politic. When they under mm. when they explain to me the beliefs behind why it's important to them, I'm happy to sit with them and have a scotch and talk to them for hours. But when it's about the blame that the other side is a cause of blame, here's the thing, I'm forty one and I voted Democrat for the last many years, but I have no problem scrutinizing the party that is as much as I will scrutinize the other side because everybody is human and everybody is fallible. And we can take that away from politics and back into our clinical research about what we were just talking about. We can take it into 
right? Any relationships and, and self-care that you have to scrutinize, you have to look at one side as equal as, you, as the other side. Otherwise, you're stuck in victimhood mentality. Well, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm 42. And uh, so we're right there at the same age and so forth, but I'm a registered independent. Um, so I've actually pushed a lever for people on both sides. How dare I? I my, my hand should be slapped, right? Right. For exactly. daring to vote for you. whatever side that you don't favor. How dare you be so open-minded and curious oh, that, so that there's open. answers everywhere. There are answers. <laughs> but I also find that a lot of people align themselves with the two-party duopoly um, because, not because they believe in everything that they say, but because they pick their favorite issue. Like, a lot of times somebody is conservative, they call themselves conservative because they don't like abortion. Right. But when you talk to them, they really are not conservative. They just don't like abortion. Exactly. But they call themselves that because the right wing looks like the home for people who call themselves pro-life. But often you'll find when you talk to people as real people, you'll find out that they call themselves these labels because of one or two you know, niche issues of theirs. Right. And I think that goes back to what we started talking about in this segment, which is that whatever works for that person should work for that person very different than what the next door neighbor or their you know friend or family member might work differently for them so so leaning it back into this self pleasure thing it right all of these things whether it's politics or anything else comes from a fear factor it comes from a us versus them it comes from i don't have the answer it comes from a maybe a lack of intellectual uh, honesty and curiosity that people want to be right. People want to know that they're safe, that they're not outside the box, that they're not weird, that they feel like they fit in somewhere. And when it comes to that, the idea of, of, of pleasure, that, you know, that the tribe that they want to subscribe to has to be relatively accepted yeah. in order for them to feel safe and comfortable. And, and I remember two years ago, I went with a buddy of mine to um, Comic-Con. I'm, I enjoy comics. I'm not like a comic fiend. And I, you know, if a Marvel movie will come out, I'll go and enjoy it. But I never been to a Comic-Con before. And I thought it was amazing because if I think about it, going back to the internet conversation, that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, these people were so isolated in this little niche population that they did, that they were like, oh, you're the weird Dungeon and Dragon person or you're the weird comic, you know, cosplay didn't exist. And if you did it, it was freaking weird. Now, this is like a whole culture within of itself that is accepted and promoted and healthy. And all of these people, imagine these like people who are like socially um, awkward, that they don't know how to approach someone else, they're not comfortable with approaching someone else, have now found their tribe and now they're having relationships and they have friends and they're maybe dating and maybe even right having you know, long-term relationships or marriages or all of these beautiful things. And that's the positive side of what's coming out from technology and the, and the internet because tribes can connect communities can connect. Research is out there, whether it's from sexuality, whether it's your little niche of whatever population you, you, you subscribe and align yourself with. I think that's the beauty of the pleasure of what's happening in 2020. I definitely agree. People want to fit in. People want to feel like they belong. People don't want to feel like they're weirdos. Um, and definitely technology now and how everything is interconnected, even though we've become more disconnected in some ways, but uh, just in reference to pleasure and being part of accepted groups around pleasure, it the internet has definitely helped. Definitely, exactly. definitely helped. Exactly. Right, and then well, taking it deeper. Go on, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, we are actually kind of uh, stopped for time here. Okay. We could go on for seven hours, but we probably shouldn't, at least not on one show. <laughs> We got to save the pleasure for another round. We got to save more of the pleasure, but I think we covered some of the, the 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 broader topics of pleasure when we talked about people resisting uh, their own sexual desires because of acceptance, because people want to be accepted, people don't want to feel weird, people want to be supported, and in previous generations, people weren't supported in things. I mean, there used to be a time where masturbation was considered like some mentally ill thing that children did. Right. Um, and now we understand that it's normal and healthy. Um, all kind of things were going mm -hmm. on. Well, uh, if you remember in the, in the medical history, going back and tying that together, which is when, 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 when they would try to treat women for hysterics, yep. right? Hysteria. 
which right, which would they would connect hysteria to the word hysterectomy. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And 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 they would actually um, do self pleasure or you know try to yes. uh, right. And yep. then you can they, they would masturbate the female to kind of get her over that. And you know, oh yeah, I, I know about all that and all the devices that they would create to stop males from masturbating. And you know, I'm sure you know the whole thing about John Kellogg and cornflakes and things like that. Right. How he created the cereal as an attempt to see if he can get people to stop masturbating. I don't know what oh. that has to do with masturbation. I, I, well, I, I guess that's where the frosted flakes came from. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, if I just there ruined that go. for everybody out there. But you shouldn't be eating that crap anyway. So no, flakes with just sugar dumped all over. I used to love frosted flakes, by the way. Right. But, Me too. Oh, Me my too. goodness. Yeah. All right, so how can people get in touch with you? What's your website? How do people contact you if they want to talk about services or just see what you're about or see any other interviews you've been on or whatever it might be. Mr. Jason, sir. So the best way to get me is on Instagram. It's Jason Wasser, L-M-F-T, all one word. And L-M-F-T stands for Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. Um, I got so much going on over there. I have in my bio, there's a link tree. So you can see, it'll take you to my website. It'll take you to information about NET. It'll take you to my podcast, uh, which is called You Winning Life, which you can also uh, have access to on any major platform, uh, any major podcast platform. And we talk about psychology and spirituality, alternative and natural wellness and entrepreneurship as the four major pillars of a successful and happy life. Uh, for those people, again, who aren't in South Florida and want to find an NET practitioner, net, N-E-T, mindbody.com. And you can find a practitioner lookup uh, on the top right of the browser bar there and the first aid stress tools also there. It's also on my website, which you can find in my bio as well on Instagram. All right, Mr. Jason Wasser, thanks for um, helping us heal our minds and heal our bodies and get pleasure from self-pleasure. It's my absolute pleasure to be here as the first, my first guest interview in 2020. Uh, and I want to thank you for all the awesome stuff and the, the bold and brave conversations you're having with everybody out there. And I'm very much looking forward to our next go round. Yeah. And, and, I, and thank you for being the first guest on a video version of Core Confidence Live. Fantastic. It's awesome. All right. Thank you, sir. All right.